10 years, and by the end of it, uh, he gave all of this to Cardinal Wojtyla, and it was taken off the ban list in 1978. This is all factual. It's in the documents of the church. You can research it all. In 1978, and began an investigative cause to determine her heroic virtue, right? To begin the path of declaring her, you know, a, a servant of God, venerable servant of God, and uh, the whole process leading up to uh, the canonization. Began it. Just began it. That was 1978. Now, does that, do you remember what else happened in 1978? Cardinal Wojtyla, by the hand of God, became Pope John Paul II right after he had got it taken off the ban list and opened up her cause. He was called to go to Rome and to become the Vicar of Christ, God's representative on earth. And all of that was fresh in his mind. And so he goes to Rome and he begins his pontificate and he sets out on a, on a platform to help the church in a new evangelization as Papa, knowing the wounds and the needs of his spiritual children, you and me. And one of the main things that he used was the divine mercy message. Did you know that his second encyclical that he wrote was called, is called, Dives in Misericordia, okay? It means rich in mercy where he unpacks the message of mercy in its biblical content in the Old Testament, the New Testament, in its theological implications, in its sacramental dimensions, in its Marian dimension, in its ecclesiological dimensions, and all of these deep things, he unpacked it in there, and he did everything but quote Faustina in it. It's a profound document. If you ever, encyclical, if you ever get a chance to read this encyclical, it'll blow you away. Dives in misericordia, rich in mercy. It's profound. And people say that generally the first or maybe the first few official documents of a papacy, it sets forth kind of the agenda that he's going to promote during his time as the vicar of Christ. And so we have this pope become this great mercy promoter, this great apostle of mercy to the world. And as he began to travel all throughout the world on planes, trains, automobiles, boats, any way that he possibly could, he took this message with him. And as his pontificate continued to progress, it came up for a miracle for Faustina's beatification. And it was approved, and Faustina was beatified. And he did it himself. John Paul II loved to do these things. He went around the world beatifying everybody. You remember, you know? He loved it. Did it all over the place. Beatified her. And then, as time progressed, another miracle happened. And by the way, this is something that, as, as an American, for all of our faults, that I take so much delight in. Because both miracles for, that got her beatified and canonized came out of the United States. I mean, as bad as we are, and we are... God still loves America. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, you know, we got problems. But both miracles came out of the United States. And actually, the promotion after the ban was lifted in 1978, it was actually my religious community that started to spread this message all over the world. So that almost, almost everything that you read about Divine Mercy comes out of Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where the National Shrine of Divine Mercy is, right? It's an amazing place. That's actually where I was ordained to the priesthood. Amazing place. So when she gets canonized, what does John Paul II, your papa, want to make a statement by that? When is she canonized? Huh. On Divine Mercy Sunday, in April of 2000, the first canonized saint of the third Christian millennium. He's setting a tone for this millennia because he knows he's not going to be here much longer. And as a matter of fact, he wouldn't be here much longer, about five more years. But he wanted to set up a path that we could look at, that we could focus on after celebrating the turn of you know, the century. Now, the first canonized saint of the third Christian millennium is going to be on Divine Mercy Sunday. And as if that's not good enough... You know what he also did on Divine Mercy Sunday? 
He declared as the Pope, because he can do this, and he did. I love it. He declared in the homily, and this Sunday will now be known, the second Sunday of Easter, as Divine Mercy Sunday. Okay? A lot of liturgists were like, what? He didn't consult us. He doesn't need to consult you. Right? He's the Pope. Okay? And he just declared it. And people were running around, oh my gosh, what does this mean? And he just did it. And then, as if that's not good enough, shortly after that, there's, there's a certain uh, 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 like congregation in Rome that, that gives like indulgences, right? You know what happened right after that? The church, with his approval, gave a plenary indulgence to those who celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday. See, there's the promises that Jesus gave to St. Faustina with the Divine Mercy message, right? And those can be applied to either yourself, right? Well, actually, no, they can only be applied to yourself. The, the promises of Jesus that go with the Divine Mercy message. But John Paul II, being Papa, he wanted to give you a double blessing. So you can get the promise for yourself on Divine Mercy Sunday, as you read in the diary, which John Paul II himself got, and I'll show you how he did that in a minute. You can get the application for the promise for yourself, a complete cleansing for yourself, almost like a new baptism, the theologians call it. Obviously, it's not a new baptism. You can only be baptized once. But as the promise is stated, and theologians have unpacked, it's like a complete cleansing for yourself. But then if you also get the plenary indulgence, guess what? You can give that complete cleansing blessed by the church, to a soul in purgatory. It's an unbelievable day. And then check this out. When he canonized Faustina at the actual ceremony, there were some uh, dignitaries who were there uh, at the reception afterwards. They, they had a reception uh, in one of the halls there, the, the big hall where they, they meet and, and do those kind of things. He turned to one of the people behind him, and this is recorded. Bishops actually heard him say this. He turned around to one of them and said, when he canonized her, this is the happiest day of my life. Now that man had seen a lot in his times. He had seen and been one who had participated in the fall of communism, had brought down, you know, the wall we know this. Even people who are not Catholic, who are historians, know that this is true, that this man had such an influence upon human history, especially in Eastern Europe, that it's un unparalleled what he was responsible for. And here he was canonizing this woman and said that that was the happiest day of his life because he had just set the path for the new millennium and he had just declared Divine Mercy Sunday. See, what father seeing his children in great need and danger, would not rejoice if he had the power to be able to dispense to his children mercy and life and a promise of complete renewal and love. I can, I'm not a father physically, but if I were, if I had the power, if God said to me, look, through you, all you got to do is make this declaration and you can do it. Do it, and I will bless your children because I know how much you love them, and I love them too. I love them more than you do. I want to do this. I'd do it. I'd say, really? Are you serious? Absolutely, I'll declare it. That's what John Paul II did. See, that's what the role of the Pope is, to dispense the mercies of God. And that's what John Paul II did. And then, as if that wasn't enough, you know what he did? You know. Actually, you're privileged here where you live in this time zone. Because when did John Paul II die? Right? Over there, he died on the vigil of Divine Mercy Sunday. But see, for you, it wasn't the vigil. It was the actual day. Right? I, people in Fiji, when I was there three months ago, told me that. And I was like... That's right. I didn't think about that. Because people told me, now, you may say this here too, so don't get mad at Fiji, Fiji people, but they said to me, time starts in Fiji, you know. 
well, you're in that same zone, you know? So, I mean, he died after having celebrated the Mass for Divine Mercy Sunday, and guess what? See, this, I also would do this if I were the Pope. <laughs> when he died, I said to myself, John Paul II, you little stinker. You approved this message, then gave a plenary indulgence. You did it and died on that day. Dude, you reaped all the benefits yourself. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. I mean, he was probably thinking to himself, okay, Lord, after I celebrate this Mass, take me now. You know what I mean? Because I've declared this with all the, the blessings and I've given a plenary indulgence for it. Let's go, you know? And he did. Unbelievable. So he basically, you know, and all of that was fresh in his mind. And so he goes to Rome and he begins his pontificate and he sets out on a, on a platform to help eight and began an investigative cause to determine her heroic virtue, right? To begin the path of declaring her, you know, a, a servant of God, venerable servant of God, and uh, the whole process leading up to John Paul II. Right after he had got it taken off the ban list and opened up her cause, he was called to go to Rome and to become the vicar of Christ. God's representative on earth. In years, and by the end of it, uh, he gave all of this to Cardinal Wojtyla, and it was taken off the ban list in 1978. This is all factual. It's in the documents of the church. You can research it all. In 1978, uh, the canonization began it. Just began it. That was 1978. Now, does that? Do you remember what else happened in 1978? Cardinal Wojtyla, by the hand of God, became Pope.